All right, I'm going to start a three-part series here on the subject of childhood conversion, Sunday school and vacation Bible school, and then finally we're going to finish it with a lot of video uh, documentation. Um, this is obviously going to be way too big of a study to put into one sermon, one video, so it's going to, have to be three parts. So that's what we're going to be doing today. And uh, we're going to start out with, what about childhood conversions? There's an awful lot of people out there that talk about becoming a Christian as a little child. Now, what does the Bible actually teach about that um, in terms of children getting saved? Is there anything in the Bible about that? We're going to look about that. Okay, turn first in your Bible to Romans chapter 4. The question comes up, if a child, a very young child dies, where do they go? We're going to see what the Bible teaches about that. Romans chapter 4 and verse 15. These are just some basic, simple things about the Bible that you should understand and know. This is just milk. It says here in Romans 4.15, Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Now, is a child born with the law in their hearts? Yes. But can they understand that law as a young child? No. They can understand I'm making mommy or daddy mad, but they don't know that they're making God mad. They can't understand that they're sinning against a holy and righteous God. They don't understand that. So where no law is, there is no transgression. Sin is not imputed to somebody, okay, when they don't understand the law. All right? So you get a little child that doesn't understand the law. They don't understand, hey, I'm sinning against God here. God's not going to impute sin to them. He's not going to send them to hell because they died in their sins. They weren't able to understand that they were sinners and they needed to get saved. They can't understand that. Turn next to Romans chapter 5. Verse 13, and here this reinforces what I just, the other verse I just read there. It says, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Okay, backs up Romans 4, verse 15. When there's no understanding of sin, then, then or when there's no understanding of the law, excuse me, then sin is not imputed at that point in time. Turn next to Deuteronomy chapter 1, way back in your Old Testament. We're going to see an example of this, an actual time when God did not impute um, sin. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 39. Okay, it says here, Moreover, your little ones, which ye sh said should be a prey, and your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, they shall go in thither, and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. What do you have here? You have the children of Israel, and a lot of them couldn't get into the promised land because of their sin. But the young children, the little ones, they had no knowledge of good and evil. They couldn't understand, hey, we're disobeying God's laws here. They couldn't get that. So the Lord looked down at them and he said, okay, they're going to get into the land, even though they might have sinned. They, I'm sure that they did things wrong. They probably disobeyed their parents, you know, dishonored their parents. They probably lied. They probably stole things, whatever. But they did not have the understanding, hey, I'm sinning against God here. So God said, okay, you can go on in. You can go into the promised land. It's kind of interesting there too because why did Moses, uh, why was he not allowed to go into the promised land? Well, because he struck the rock and took the glory away from the Lord to make the water come out, okay? It's kind of funny because you have little children all the time, they're hitting stuff, you know. So God imputed it as sin to Moses, but he wouldn't impute sins to children. Turn next to 2 Samuel chapter 12. Second Samuel chapter 12. And we're going to go to verse 22. And this is where you have David. He had sinned and God struck his son that was born, the illegitimate son there. Um, he struck him with sickness. And here's what happens. Verse 22, And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. 
For I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead, wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Was David a saved man? Yeah, he certainly was. Okay, then where did David go when he died? Well, in process of time, I understand that, you know, the Old Testament thing there, the blood wasn't shed yet, the perfect blood of Jesus Christ wasn't shed yet. I understand that. But David is in heaven right now. Where's his son at? David said, I'm going to go to him. Where's his son? In heaven. You mean to tell me that a son of an adulterous relationship where the man killed the woman's husband and then slept with her? And God would allow a child like that to go to heaven? Absolutely. Yeah, why? It wasn't the child's fault. See? You can get the worst couple out there that's drunken, fornicating, God-hating, atheists, whatever. If their child dies in infancy, is it the child's fault? The child was born of that sinful relationship, but it's not the child's fault. They didn't do anything wrong. So why would God take a little child like that and send him down to hell? He wouldn't. It's interesting, too, because you have all these abortions. I don't even know what the number is. You know, you always hear over 50 million. I have no idea what the updated number is. It's probably quite a bit more, maybe up to 60 million by now. I don't know. But the point is, there are at least 50 million babies that have been aborted in America alone, probably over 100 million worldwide. Where are those babies? Heaven. You say, how do you know? We just read about it. Sin is not imputed when there is no law. Those little babies, and they were babies, they weren't such some kind of little tissue down there, fetus. I won't use that term, fetus. Okay, that's satanic. That does not appear in your King James Bible. When a woman has a baby in her, she's said to be with child. There again, biblical vocabulary, people. Don't say pregnant that's not a King James Bible word. You say she's with child. And boy, wouldn't that make women think if we could get the word pregnant out of our society, out of our culture, as English-speaking people, if we said, oh, you're with child. Oh, it's not a fetus down there. No, it's a child. And we're not even talking about all the children that have died as a result of uh, birth control. That's a whole other issue. Say, oh, no, not that. Oh, yeah. But what does the Bible say about the mind of children? Okay, you have a, a child that's an infant. Now, when they get to a certain age, now they can understand, hey, I'm sinning against God. But what about that time in between? The child that's like a baby that can't even talk. And then until the child, they start to talk and they start to understand things. From that time until the time they become accountable. Accountable. What about that time in there? What's the Bible say about the mind of a child in that time? Turn to Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 15. Okay. Okay. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 15. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. I don't believe in spanking children. Well, then you're not a Bible believer. Children need to be spanked. You know why? Because their minds can't understand why they're doing wrong. You know, you can't sit that child down and say, now, I would like to just help you to under have you understand this. The fact that you broke that uh, lamp over there in the living room. Now, see, I'm gonna show you our monthly budget here and you can see that we really can't afford to, to have a new lamp this, this month. And do you understand that this is going to make a problem for us fiscally this year? And the child says, oh yes, I see that, I'm very sorry. <laughs> they don't understand that. You say, hey, did you break that? I didn't, I, I wasn't my fault. I, okay, come on back in here. It's time for a spanking. I don't want a spanking. Sorry, you're going to have to get a spanking. I got spankings when I was little. You know, my wife got them, you know. And you know what? 
they used to, the old saying, they used to, used to say, well, you'll thank me when you're older. Well, guess what? I'm thankful now that I'm older. Because if I would have been allowed to get away with anything, I would have turned out rotten. I'd have been a brat. Okay, I was not allowed to get away with things. I got a lot of spankings <laughs> different times. So, you know, and you can take it. I mean, give me a break. These people, oh, it's, it's damaging the child and stuff. No, it's damaging the child when you don't spank them. When a child knows I can manipulate my parents and get away with murder, that's damaging the child. That's when you hurt the child. But, you know, let's reverse the thing. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Okay, wouldn't it be weird if you had an adult? Foolishness is bound in the heart of an adult, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. You get some guy that messes up at work, and the boss comes in and says, All right. It's time for a spanking. You know, <laughs> no. Why? What changes? Well, when adult, when you reach a certain age, now you can understand, hey, I've done wrong. And now you're accountable. Okay? You're accountable to God. But when a child is very, very young, they can't quite understand things up here yet. That's why you correct it back here. <laughs> okay? And you know, I'm not I, when when the Bible says the rod of correction shall drive far from him. That doesn't mean that the child's on the floor and you're just taking that some kind of a uh, a rod and just smacking them over the face and hitting them and bloodying them and stuff. No, 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 no. You know, the thing of punishing a child, of spanking a child, there needs to be some restraint there. There needs to be some, you know, you you aren't paddling them in, in your fury and your wrath. You're saying, I'm very disappointed in you. And now this is, you know, I have to do this. I have to spank you. I didn't want to do this, but whack. See, that's the right thing there. But again, you see, a child's mind is not able to understand the difference between right and wrong. That's why you spank them. Continuing, Proverbs chapter 23, verse 13 and 14. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Oh, you say it's the grave. No, it's called hell. I mean, think about the NIV rendering there. Oh, um, it's all the Old Testament references to hell should be actually the grave, which is what they do, by the way. I'm not making that up. Uh, how do you deliver somebody from the grave? You say, well, that just means premature death. Oh, come on. Everybody dies. You know, that, that saying is just, it totally takes away from the, the meaning of the text there. What's going on? You deliver a child, you deliver their soul from hell by dis disciplining them. That way they know, hey, I have chores to do. I have things I have to do. I have things, I have limits with my parents. So I'm not allowed to go beyond that. You know, and so what you have is you have a child that gets older and they understand there are rules. There are laws that they must abide by. But when you get a child that is just left to themselves and they do whatever they feel like doing, well, guess what? They get out in life and they say, I don't want to have a job. I don't want to work. They're like a big child, you know. I don't want to work for a living. I'll just go steal what I want. I'll just take it. And all of a sudden they're stealing things. And the police come and say, you're under arrest. Fine, I'll get out and I'll do it again. And you have a first-rate criminal. Why? Well, it goes back to a parent not disciplining their children. It's important to discipline your children. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 22 and through 26. It says, Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding the father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. Uh, thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. My son, give my, me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. Very, very interesting there. A wise child will respect and listen to their parents. Okay, that shows a great deal of wisdom. Okay, I don't have this on this one. This That'll be the other study I'm thinking about. Um, we'll get into it in the next study. Uh, interesting thing there on that verse. But um, turn next to Proverbs chapter 29. The one verse that we just read there I was talking about. Proverbs chapter 29, 
and verse 15. We'll see this thing again. Proverbs 29, verse 15 says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Again, proving what I was just saying. A child that's left to themselves, they'll throw little temper tantrums out in public and stuff like that. You'll see that. You'll see it. You'll see some little rotten brat screaming his little fool head off because he didn't get his way out in a shopping mall, and you see the mother just kind of embarrassed and humiliated by her son. Why? She didn't spank him. I saw a mother the one time, and her, her little boy was having a little hissy fit, you know, and screaming and kicking and holding his breath and the whole thing, you know. And she was, she was there, and she was going, does mommy need to spank you? Does mommy need to spank you? Does, do I need to spank you? And I thought, what's he going to do? Say yes? <laughs> you know, spank the child, you know. I mean, give him, uh, like my, my grandmother used to say, give him a reason to cry. A lot of truth in that. But notice there it says, the rod and reproof. So you don't just, the child does something bad and you kick him or you, you know, swat him or something like that. No, you sit him down and you say, let me understand why you're going to get, or let me explain why you're going to get punished. All right, this is what you've done wrong. And you reprove them. You show them, you know that this is a rule of the house and you disobeyed that. See, that's how they begin to develop a sense of right and wrong. It comes from the parents. You say, no, it comes from the Sunday school teachers and the public school teachers. No, it comes from the parents. You have a responsibility to teach your children. And again, you know, a child left to himself bringeth his mother, mother to shame. Why? Because they can't make rational decisions on their own. It's important to understand that. All right, look at Proverbs 29, verse 17. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Okay, again, you see the thing there of proper discipline leads to a proper child. Very important. You let your children get away with things, They'll eventually get away with murder. They'll eventually be just a rotten individual. You are damaging your child by not punishing them. Turn next to Ecclesiastes 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 16. This is a good one, too. Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child and thy princes eat in the morning. You know, kind of interesting there, you know, because when you have children that are starting to get power, uh, that's usually when a country is starting to fall apart. And, you know, you could look at, you ever want to have an interesting study, and we're going to be actually studying this as in the third part of this uh, video series here, the thing of Nazi Germany and the Hitler Youth. The Hitler Youth had political power. And there were stories of these guys, they'd be marching down the street, playing their drums and carrying the swastika and stuff, the flag of the Nazi party. And if people didn't salute, they could actually say, arrest that person. Little children. Little children walking along and old, and the one guy was laughing about it, he said he can still remember seeing old women, you know, doing the Heil Hitler thing as they walked by saluting the flag as it's going by, you know. What's going on there? They were afraid of little children. Woe to the land that's like that. Hey, did Nazi Germany have problems? Because of children running the older people? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like today, here in America, where these children in public schools are told, you know, if you see your parents doing things that are bad and for the, you know, bad for the environment, taking hot baths too often, and if they have any fur or things like that, you know, they're probably making the, the earth warmer, and you should, you should uh, you know, report them to us. And if your parents have illegal firearms, you know, you should do that too. See, we're going right back into Nazi Germany again. And um, actually, Nazi Germany came into us. But uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Watch the third part. But uh, we'll continue on here. Um, Isaiah chapter 3. 
Isaiah chapter 3. We'll go there. Okay, it says here in verse 1, For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water, the mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet, and the prudent and the ancient, the captain of fifty, and the honorable man, and the counselor, and the cunning artificer, and the eloquent orator. Now look at this, verse 4, And I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them, and the people shall be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient, and the base against the honorable. You know what happens when children rule a nation? It falls to pieces. That's a symbol of God's judgment. You say, but can't children make rational decisions, Brian? No. The mind of a child is foolishness. A child cannot make rational decisions. Do you see where I'm going with this? What's the title of this sermon? Childhood conversion. What about childhood conversions? If a child can't rule a nation, if a child cannot uh, have the understanding to obey their parents without getting a spanking once in a while, how then can a child understand, I'm a sinner, I need to be saved? Truly understand it. How can they get it? Something to think about. Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. That's where we're going to go next. Jeremiah 1 verse 4 through 10. Okay, it says here, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord poured forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Now notice a couple things there. The most important thing is that God called Jeremiah in his youth. But it wasn't until God put his words in Jeremiah's mouth that Jeremiah was ready to speak. God had to give him wisdom. But you say, well, he, he would have had enough wisdom on his own. Why did God have to interfere? No, he didn't have enough wisdom on his own because he was a child. Again, the mind of a child there doesn't quite understand things. God has to give them wisdom. And I believe that there's a certain point in time, which many people call the age of accountability, and that certain point in time is when God comes along and says, here, here's the wisdom. There's some kind of a situation, and now they all of a sudden they do something and they realize, I've sinned against God here. This isn't just my parents, you know, finding out. I've actually sinned against God. And they feel that conscience there bearing witness for the first time. They're told to do something, and they go, oh, something doesn't feel right here. And they go ahead and do it, and then they feel kind of like, oh, I did some kind of a sin. See, at that point, I believe that they've reached the age of accountability. Not because I'm disobeying what my mom and dad told me to do or something. No, they understand for the first time their conscience bears witness, and they say, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And they don't really even understand why yet but they understand, I just did something very, very wrong here. Now, you say, what age is that going to happen, Brian? At the age of 10? Well, that depends on the child. There are some children that mature quicker than others, some a little bit slower. I don't really know. But the point is, to just say, any child out there can get saved and understand salvation, 
It's very, very dangerous. I'm going to show you later on why I say it's so dangerous. But turn next to Hosea chapter 11. Hosea. Ah. There it is. Okay. Oop. Hosea chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. It says here, When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Balaam and burned incense to graven images. I taught Ephraim also to go, taking them by their arms, but they knew not that I healed them. I thought that was an interesting picture there of Israel. Israel as a young child. God says he took them by their arms. You know, you get the little child and they're wobbly on their legs and stuff and they can barely stand. And you grab, you know, they put their hands up and you grab their hands and you hold them and you walk them along. And then they're, hey, now they're confident because they can walk because they have you supporting them. You know, very good picture of, you know, God dealing with this little child of Israel, this young nation. You know, it's after they left Egypt there. Now turn to your New Testament, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. Ephesians chapter 4. Now we have here verses 14 and 15. We'll read that. And again, think about the mind of a child here. Okay. It says here that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. You know one of the things you'll see more about children, if you're around children, you have nieces or nephews or your own children or whatever, one of the things that you will see is a child is very often tossed to and fro with their little ideas that they come up with. One minute you have a little boy and, and he comes in and he's got a fire hat on, you know, firefighter's hat on. You say, hey, you know, what are you going to be when you grow up? I'm going to be a firefighter. You see that same child two weeks later and he's got a baseball hat on. I'm going to play baseball. And I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a, I'm going to be a, a, a astronaut. I'm going to be a this. I'm going to be a that. They're fickle. The mind of a child is very fickle. They're just, they, they're all over the place. And, you know, you look at children, especially ones that watch a lot of TV, their attention span is about five seconds, if you're lucky. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm going to play with this toy over here. Da, 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 whoop. Okay, I'm going to drop it and go over here and play with this. I think I'm going to run and jump up on the sofa or I'm going to do this. I'm, they're fickle. Oh, but, but a child that age can get saved and they stick with it their whole lives, right? No, I'm afraid not. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Turn there next. You know, and I just want to say something as we're turning here. A lot of people get very upset with me and they say, oh, you're always questioning people's salvation, Brian. You're always putting doubt in people's minds and stuff like that. Yeah, let me just explain why I do that, okay? A lot of people get upset with me about that, you know, just, Brian, it's just faith. You're just overcomplicating salvation. No, I'm not overcomplicating salvation. The process of salvation is very easy. You come to God as a sinner, understanding I can't sin myself, or save myself, excuse me, and you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ thou shalt be saved. It's a simple process. But the problem is, there's so much deception about getting to the point of salvation. That's the danger. And I think it's a very, very serious thing just to tell people, oh, you're saved. You say, uh, do you believe in Jesus? Well, sure, I think so. Okay, you're a Christian. Congratulations. Yay. You know, hey, you know, what's your story? I go to church. Well, then you're a Christian. Yay. You know what scares me more than anything else? The thing that scares me is if I tell somebody that they're saved when in reality they're lost, 
and I should have been there to convict them of their sins. I should have been there to point them to Jesus Christ and to end their self-righteousness. And instead I told them that they're saved and they're lost and they go to hell because of what I say to them. That's a great fear to me. I don't want to tell people, oh no, you're saved, you're a Christian. Oh yeah, you're absolutely a Christian when they might not be. And I'm going to tell you right now, a lot of childhood conversions are false. You say, how do you know, Brian? Because I was one. I got saved as a young boy. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself here a little bit, but the point is I, got, I, I went and I prayed this prayer of salvation, you know, and I, I actually found out I'd prayed it. Um, I was talking to my mother about it the one time, and she said I prayed first when I was like two years old. And then it was eight years old in Sunday school. But then I looked at my life up until the point I was 25 years old. I wasn't living like a Christian. You say, well, you were just carnal. Well, maybe I was. But then again, maybe I wasn't. And you see, if I would have counted on that early profession and ended up dying and going to hell, what a tragedy. That's why when I was 25 years old, I got scared. And I said to the Lord, I don't know if I'm saved. I have no idea. I'm not living like a Christian. I have nothing in common with the people in this book. Not a thing in common with the people in this book. I get along with people. I love the world. The world loves me. I don't have anything in common with these people. I don't understand the Bible. I don't understand a lot of things that are going on. I don't, I don't believe I'm a Christian. And I got my salvation sorted out. I got my relationship with the Lord finalized. To now I can tell you, I know I'm saved. All right, I know what it means to be a Christian. I can relate to the book now, finally. All right, You say, well, Brian, you might have been saved. That's not a chance I'm willing to take. I mean, if you give me a, 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 you know, I find a vial of liquid out here someplace, or I find a vial of liquid somewhere, and, and you know, I, I take it and I, I just unscrew the cap and say, well, this might be water. It might be cyanide, but it might be water, so I'm just going to I'm just going to drink it. Nobody would do that in their right mind. You're going to look at that liquid and say, "Well, there's no label on it." Boy, I'd have to take this thing to a lab or something and have it tested to know what, you know, doesn't have any smell, but I'm not drinking that. Are you crazy? Now you'd have enough common sense to do that, but a lot of people don't have enough common sense to say, "Am I really saved?" and to make sure of their salvation. See, that's why I'm doing these studies. But let's take a look at some godly children in the Bible. Okay? Well, actually, here we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20. Um, he says here, Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. So again, Paul is saying to these Corinthian believers, and, you know, it's interesting because another place he says, you know, I'm afraid of you, lest I've bestowed upon you labor in vain. Paul was questioning their salvation. Why? They were turning on him. They were, they were acting like babies, really. Now, there can be some carnality there, I understand. But you get somebody who's been saved for years and years and years, you know, saved for years and years and years, and they're still carnal? That's dangerous. That's real dangerous. But let's take a look at some godly children in the Bible. 1 Samuel chapter 3. Back to the Old Testament. 1 Samuel 3. Verses 1 through 7. Okay, it says here, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was pre precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim, that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli, and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not, lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli, and said, here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. 
Wait a second. Hold on here. Hold on, hold on. Samuel was actually dedicated to the Lord as a baby. You know? He was actually, his mother said, if, God, if you give me a son, I'm going to give him to you. He'll be a priest forever. I won't even raise him. I'll, you know, keep him till he's weaned, and then I'm just going to give him to you. Well, wouldn't you think a guy like that would be saved? A boy like that? No. It says there, Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. So what was it? It was before the age of accountability. He didn't understand. Now, a child is weaned many times, maybe when they're one, maybe two years old. I'm not really sure. Um, you know, but they're fairly young. And yet Samuel here, it's years later. I don't know how old he would have been at this point in time, but it was many years later, and he didn't know the Lord yet. And the word of the Lord was not yet revealed to him. So how could he have been saved shortly after being weaned and given to the priest there? Doesn't make sense. I'm real careful when I hear somebody say, I got saved at the age of two and I'm, I've been a Christian since then. I mean, we were, I remember the one time we were out going door to door and uh, we met this, this woman and she was like, you know, if you died tonight, you know, would you, you know for sure where you'd go? And she said, yes, yeah, she said, I'd go to heaven. We said, why would that be? And she said, well, because uh, I'm saved, I'm born again. And uh, she said, actually, I thought I got saved when I was two years old. And she said, but by the time I was a teenager, I wasn't living like a Christian. And she said, I had to realize that my salvation was a false conversion. And that's when I truly came to the Lord as a sinner, and that's when I truly got saved. Praise the Lord. Good testimony. Okay? But you have these people that are getting saved at Sunday school, at VBS, and things like this. These childhood conversions, they're not legitimate. I really hate to tell you, but they're not legitimate. And we're going to see later on why I'm, I'm so emphatic on this. 1 Timothy 3, 6 says, Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now, if you're not supposed to have a bishop that's a novice, what would make you think that a man or that a child could get saved? I mean, talk about a novice. <laughs> Who's more of a novice than a child? But you say, well, I think a child can get saved. It's a bad idea. Turn next to 1 Kings chapter 3. First Kings chapter three. Verse five through ten. Okay, it says here, In Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he has as as Excuse me. According as he walked before thee in truth, and in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with thee, and thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne, as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David thy father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. Huh. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people, that cannot be numbered, nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this, thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Okay, that's very important. Solomon asked for wisdom when he was a little child. Again, why would he ask for wisdom if he already had it? He didn't have it. He was a child. He could not discern between good and bad. How then can somebody be saved when they can't discern between good and bad? Now, Matthew chapter 18. Go there next. So this is an argument that's going to be used as a counter-argument against what I'm trying to say today. Matthew chapter 18. 
verses 1 through 6, people say, but didn't Jesus tell people that we should be like little children? Didn't he say that? Let's look about that. Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same as the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and whoso re shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Okay? Now notice a couple things here. First of all, this teaching is about the physical millennial kingdom of heaven. Okay? And there's works involved in that thing. Okay, read over in Matthew chapter 25. They're going to the, the poor, the sick, you know, and visiting people in jail and things. There's a lot of works involved in getting into that kingdom. Okay, verse 3 says that conversion precedes becoming like a little child, except you be converted and become as little children. It doesn't say, except you be a little child and get converted. No, it says, be converted and then act like a little child when it comes to your faith. You should just trust the Lord for everything and not have to worry and doubt like adults do. Okay, this passage is about having childlike trust to inherit the millennial kingdom. And that's what they're going to have to have, by the way, at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. They're going to have to believe like a little child that Jesus is coming. I know he's coming. Yeah, but listen, you can see the Antichrist forces out there. They're coming up through the valley. You know, they're, they're sending warnings to us. Doesn't matter. I know Jesus is coming. See, faith like a little child it doesn't mean that they are little children. So don't fall for that, for that one. You say, what about training up a child in the way he should go? How can you train up a child in the way he should go and when he's already won't depart from it if a child doesn't have understanding? Huh? Let's look about that. Proverbs chapter 22. Hey, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. It says here, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, I've actually heard parents say that this verse is probably a mistranslation or some kind of a, I don't think the Lord was right on this because, after all, I had children and we trained them the right way and they grew up to be corrupt. So obviously, this verse, I think, is wrong. I don't think God knows what he was talking about in this verse. I've heard people say that, you know. Well, what's going on there? You say, well, the Bible says that uh, you're to train up a child in the way he should go when he's old, he won't depart from it. But there's a lot of people that were trained up as Christians, and now they've departed from it. So what's going on? Was well, the Bible wrong? No. The way they trained their children was wrong. See, there's a Bible way, a Bible method to you training your children. Now, you notice what I said there? I said to you training your children. You see, if you have your child and your child is there, let's see, you have one more place to look up, but I can close my Bible for now. If you have a child, okay, and that child is there in your home, and now they reach that certain age, and now it's, we're going to take you to Sunday school. Well, that's an hour, two hours, whatever, uh, that you don't have your child. You don't know what's going on. And there's many, many stories, by the way, I'll be getting into this in the next part of the study. There's many, many stories of people, Sunday school teachers, teaching and doing horrible things with children. There are child molesters all over the place, and they'll go into the Sunday schools in these Babel, build, Babel buildings looking for victims. Mm-hmm. Do it all the time. You know? I knew a guy that committed suicide because he was molested as a child at a Christian camp. Sure. Oh, that's just the Catholics, Brian. Uh-huh. Sure. No, it's all the Protestants as well. 
that stuff goes on. Not as much as the Catholics, I understand that, but it still goes on. But you lose control of your child for that hour or two going to Sunday school. And then you bring them home and you say, okay, get up tomorrow morning, and now I'm going to send you to a public school for five days out of the week. What is it, eight hours a day or something like that? It's like having a full-time job. They go off to some public school somewhere where you know they're going to be taught evolution theory. They're going to be taught that the Bible is a lie. They're going to be taught sex education. They're going to be taught all kinds of things that are contrary to your beliefs. And why do you do it? Well, because we have to have a nice house. We have to have two cars, Brother Brian. We have to have careers for both husband and wife. And then you say, they get, the kid gets older and they leave, the, they leave and they say, I don't want anything to do with the Lord or I hate God and stuff like this. And you go, well, the Bible must be a contradiction because it says that you're to train up a child in the way he should go when he's old, he won't depart from it. And he departed. So the Bible must be in, in, in error. No, the way you raised your children was an error. And again, you say, Brian, you're being kind of harsh. Um, you know why I'm being harsh? Because this is the way I was raised. I was not homeschooled. I was not kept away from Sunday schools at a Babel building. I went through Sunday school. While in Sunday school, I saw kids fighting. There were kids that were talking about fornication. I didn't even really understand it back when, in that time. My wife, in her Sunday school, this is in her testimony, if you've seen it already. If not, you better watch it. But uh, she talked about, she was taught how to country line dance in Sunday school. And given coffee in Sunday school. I had a Sunday school teacher in the Babel building where I grew up. He would punch me and hit me. You know, oh, then, you, then you're bitter because you were scarred. Oh, you know, yeah, right. I don't get scarred unless I cut myself, okay? <laughs> I have no mental scars from my childhood. Give me a break. You know, uh, there's all kinds of stuff that goes on in Sunday schools. There was a Baptist uh, Babel building right up here, um, not too far from where we're at right now in Myerstown, uh, Pennsylvania, and uh, we're still recording this thing in Pennsylvania, but we're, I'll get into that later. But uh, there was a Baptist church up there, excuse me, built uh, Babel building. There was one up there. And um, the Sunday school teacher married to the senior pastor's daughter, they got, he got caught driving around to drive up windows, you know, uh, McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King, whatever, driving around to drive up windows with his pants down. Police called on him and stuff like that. Went to jail. Sunday school teacher. Mm -hmm. I talked to a guy the one time on the phone. He was telling me about a Sunday school teacher at the Baptist Babel building he was going to. The guy had a criminal record and ended up killing a woman. Teaching Sunday school. Mm -hmm. See, what's going on is these people, you're doing things the wrong way. And, and it's interesting, too, by the way, because this thing of training up a child in the way he should go and he's old, he won't depart from it. There were a couple things that my parents instilled in me, and those things I haven't departed from. And if my parents would have been there to train me the entire time through my childhood, things would have probably turned out different for me. I went through a lot of sin and a lot of other things. Kids in, in high school, kids in my intermediate and elementary school and things like that, they're looking at porn. That's how I got into it. You say, well, Brian, you, 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 know, you need to be around other children so that you'll be properly developed. Oh, I was properly developed, all right. I developed a life of sin, a life of perversion, because I was with other children. I remember sitting in the Babel building I grew up in. I remember sitting there wishing that somebody could disprove God's existence so that I could sin and not feel guilty about it. But I was a Christian at that point in time because I had prayed the prayer in Sunday school years earlier. Sure. See, again, if you don't know me that well, if you're just stumbling onto these videos and you've seen this thing, you don't really know my history and things, what you need to understand is I'm not coming from the King James only Bible believing Baptist independent fundamental Baptist system. I didn't come from that. I came from the modern church. 
I came from modern professing Christianity with the new versions used in NIV for 15 years. I didn't come from the homeschooled, living out in the wilderness kind of a thing. Uh-uh, uh-uh, public schooling. I went through it. So did my wife. We're both the products of that modern system. That's why we're speaking against this thing. But you say, could you show me some other evidence? Well, let me show you here. I have here, hold on a second. I have here an article, and you can find these things all over the internet. This is just one as an example to prove what I'm saying. Uh, my journey from Christian to atheist. Okay, this is, uh, what is it? X, xchristian.net. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, by Tracy is the name here. It says here, I was born into a Southern Baptist Christian family. Before I could hold my head up on my own, I had been dedicated to God. I accepted Jesus as my Savior when I was four years old and was baptized when I was five. I attended a Christian school from preschool through third grade and again in eighth grade when it, where I was forced into chapel every day, not counting regular church and Sunday school on Sunday mornings and nights, as well as church on Wednesday at the age of eight, my parents felt that God was telling them it was time to move. And so began my experience with the Pentecostal Holiness Church. Oh boy. And then I'm, I'm going to skip some of this thing here. It's, it's kind of long. You can read it. I have the, I'll put the article up there. But it says here, And I first spoke in tongues when I was 12. I was in a room full of other girls my age, and the focus of our Wednesday night meeting was for everyone to accept the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. I didn't realize it then, but I was already a skeptic. A saved skeptic? Hardly. I watched the other girls with the five or ten prayer warriors that had come to assist with the night's project. They all spoke in tongues before I did. While I thought that it was all rather strange and didn't understand it, I understood, or understand, I did understand that it was expected of me and that I was obviously not a normal Christian if I wasn't doing it too. And so after hours of attempting to invite the Holy Spirit into my body, I finally spoke in tongues. Most of the other girls were still going at it. I recall standing there with a strange babble coming out of my mouth and thinking that it was the most bizarre thing I had ever seen. I continued to go to the same church for the next several years. I participated in all the church functions and carried my Bible every day to the public school my parents finally had sent me to. Despite accusations of being weird, I continued continue to show my dedication to my God. At some point, I realized that I very rarely read my Bible because I couldn't make any sense of it out of it. It also disturbed me that my God was so violent and at times merciless, and so I ignored it altogether. I didn't begin to question things until the 11th grade. My parents tend to think that I began questioning their belief, beliefs because of the public school setting, though I can assure you that was not the case. Uh, this young woman is very ignorant. Okay, It was because of the public schooling, and it was also because she never got saved. She wasn't saved, and her parents weren't raising her according to the Bible way. But we'll skip down here the next one. Uh, she talks about um, some different things there. Again, I'm not going to go over it all, but she says, After my prom, I began to ask questions. Neither my parents nor my pastors were comfortable answering most of them. What a shame. The ones they did not, or they did take into consideration were answered with Bible verses that left me with more questions that they refused to answer. At times I offended people to the point of anger. Somehow the fact did not sit well with me. This continued through the 12th grade. Thank you, public schooling. And then she goes down through here and she met a guy and it says, it was his influence that led me to, this, to my decision to lose my virginity to one of my friends, or one of his friends. To me, it was a big deal. It was a major turning point in my life and I realized after doing it that I didn't feel bad about it. She killed her conscience, in other words. I thought there would be guilt and possibly fear of God's judgment, but there wasn't. I felt like a weight had been lifted from my shoulders. I was finally able to let go of the good girl facade and live a little bit. <laughs> that's, what, that's all atheism is. You know, these people have no proof. They, you know, look around you people. Give me a break. There is no God. The fool hath said in his heart there is no God. Give me a break. This all just happened by random chance. Ah, uh, sure. Yeah. The reason that there is atheism, and I'm not talking about communistic atheism where the teaching about God and the Bible has been kept from people. I'm talking about real atheism, the people that have heard about the Bible and reject it. 
It's because the same reason I was going to reject it when I was a false convert is because you are sinning and you don't want people judging you for your sins. That's the whole issue there. This girl was never a real convert to Jesus Christ. I guarantee it. Why? Because I went through the same thing. You know? I didn't fornicate, but the point is, they came close a couple times when I was a kid. Anyways, um, I soon became a self-proclaimed seeker. I was in search of the truth and would be for several years. I once asked a question during a theological discussion between the men at a home gathering. I received sharp glares and no answers. I still had serious doubts about religion, but I didn't doubt God. And then she says here, I realized that, that whether I was frightened of hell or not, I couldn't believe in a God that people believed would kill others for their gain. So my questions remain, but I knew my loyalty could not lie with such a God. And then she spells a lowercase g, which lowercase g in the Bible is a reference to Satan, you know, or other devils. So she's not talking about the God of the Bible. It's funny, you know, they, these people think they're so smart and they're really just fools. But then last paragraph here it says, And then I found Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, xchristian.net, and the atheism subreddit. And now I'm sure. I've talked to many others with backgrounds similar to mine. And I've accepted over the past several months that children in America are brainwashed by Christianity. No, they're brainwashed by Baptist or whatever denomination, Babel buildings called churches. Churchianity is what they're brainwashed by. They are so open and willing to accept what they're told that they don't question things. And by the time they think to question them, it's too late. Luckily, I have a support system that has allowed me to question things and finally find the answers that I was looking for. I will not believe in a God who condones rape and murder, to name a few. I would rather believe in the universe or whatever else doesn't kill people in the name of religion. I am now an atheist. This is my first time saying it, typing it, and it is rather empowering. <laughs> Oh, what a little fool. You say, what's going on there? She was put into a system as a child, and she was told, this is what you believe. Her mind was not able to understand what she was being told. She couldn't understand, hey, I'm a sinner. Hey, I need to really, truly get saved here. I've sinned before a holy and righteous God. It's between me and him. She didn't understand any of that. So what did she do? She just went along with the program until she got to a point where, in her teens... She started to rebel against God, and it's like, I don't believe God exists. You know? And she goes off to a bunch of other sinners that don't want to believe in God. They don't want their sins judged. And then she uses their stupidity to reinforce her own stupidity. What a shame. And what a problem has been created by Christians. You see, in our zeal to win souls, we've created a whole bunch of things that have no basis in Scripture. Buildings called churches. Sunday school programs. Vacation Bible school. All of these things have no basis in Scripture. So, oh, Brother Brian, I can't agree with you. Okay then, smarty pants, show me. I get so sick and tired of that. You know, oh, Brian, you're such a heretic and everything. Okay, show me from the Bible where I'm wrong. Show it to me. I'll change. Show me where anybody set up a Sunday school and invited lost children into it. Show me where they were doing vacation Bible school and having good, fun games and everything else and leading little children in prayers of salvation. Show it to me. It's not in there. But you say, does the Bible talk about these false converts? Does the Bible say anything about this? Childhood conversion, that's actually false conversion. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2. That's where we're going to close our study, at least the first part of it. We'll go on to some more things after this. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20 through 22. Okay, it says here, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it 
to turn from the holy commandment to, delivered unto them, but it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. You say, uh, Tracy, you know what Tracy is according to scripture? Sal, that was washed right back to the mire. Why? Because all she ever had was the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. She never had a personal relationship with Jesus. Neither do any of these other atheists. I was raised a Christian and now I'm an atheist and I hate God. No, you were never a Christian. In name, you might have called yourself a Christian, a Methodist, a Baptist, a Presbyterian, a whatever. Doesn't matter. But in reality, you were never saved. These atheists, they're never saved. Why? Because some overzealous Christian led them in a prayer, a false prayer, a false conversion as a child, when the child is not able to discern between good and evil. And that's why this, this whole movement, this whole atheistic movement is running so rampant. Now I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to get a little ahead of myself here give you something to look forward to in the next study. You say, well, Brian, uh, I don't think you should be cutting on the Sunday School movement. I mean, that is an established orthodox practice that we have as Christians. Uh, no, actually, in reality, the modern day practice of Sunday School only dates back to the 1930s and 1940s. You say, what? It goes farther back than that. Well, yeah, kids being taken into a Sunday School type of a thing. I'm gonna show you proof of that you know, in further studies here. But uh, the reality of it is, the actual modern day practice is not even 100 years old. Hmm. And Vacation Bible School's younger e even than that. Vacation Bible School is one of the more wicked things out there. You say, why is that? A little thing called groupthink. And you get all these children together and you just, you, you know playing sports and stuff like that and then you got them all wired up on candy and everything else and and you come in you say okay children every head bowed every eye closed if you're here today and you've not trusted Jesus I want you to stand up or something you know and if, if you know Jesus as your Savior stand up well guess what's going to happen children respond probably more than anything to peer pressure so that child's there and they, they look around they're going everybody else is standing up well, I heard about Jesus this week. I guess I should stand up too. And they stand up and they go, huh. And the preacher goes, well, if you're here today and you're standing up and then you're telling me that you know Jesus as your Savior, congratulations, you're on your way to heaven. And the kid goes, wow, I'm a Christian now. What do I got to believe? Oh, okay, you know, come here to this Babel building and do what I'm told and that'll get me to heaven. And later on, they get into the teenage years and they go, you know what, I really don't like going to this Babel building every week. I'm getting sick and tired of being told what to do. You know what, I wonder if God really even exists. I wonder if the Bible is really true. I mean, there's so many versions of it. Why should I believe that this book is really truly God's word? I mean, my pastor doesn't even believe it. After a while, they go to the public schooling, they go through their college and university and whatever, and they... And they're told, the Bible's a lie, the Bible's a lie, you're here by chance, you're just, do what you want, you know, live how you please. Guess what they do? They drop this profession that they've had, this knowledge that they've had of Jesus Christ, they drop it like a hot rock. And they come back hating God. The dog, which is a man, returns to his own vomit again. Returns back to the world. That's what God thinks of the world, by the way, vomit, you know. And the sow, the woman, returns to the mire where she was wallowing. That's what God thinks of it. Thinks of these atheists that were raised Christian and now they hate God. So, that's going to be it for part one. Uh, we're going to continue on to part two here. Um, and we're still in the process of moving to Maine and everything else, so... Uh, we'll do another video, just an update video, so I don't want to get into a whole lot here. But thank you for watching this first part. We'll continue in the part two, and I'm going to show you about Sunday School and VBS and who should actually be teaching 
your children. If you have children, who should be the one that's instructing them? All right, so continue on to part two.